Hello and welcome everybody to our panel talk on fashion and digitalization. On behalf of the German Fashion Council, I would also give a very warm welcome to our viewers from the live stream. My name is Philipp Löwe. I am an editor with Der Spiegel. And I'm looking forward to discuss the upheavals of the fashion industry with my four guests sitting next to me. They all are based in Berlin and take part in FCG's program Digital Fashion Future Readiness. And one more information, I will refer to the Fashion Council Germany from now on as the FCG, so you all know what I'm talking about. Sitting right next to me is Julia Leifert from the brand of the same name. Right next to her is Mira van der Osten from Kruba. Afterwards is Tina Lutz Morris from Lutz Morris. And on my other side, Michael Pfeiffer from Mood. So let me introduce my guest before we dive into our topic. Julia, you have a background in fashion and design management, which you studied in New York and Berlin. You founded your first label in 2014, and since 2015, you are an ir inherent part of Berlin Fashion Week. You describe your work as new luxury design made in Germany, and what I find very interesting, also have a profound understanding of sustainability and fair labor. Welcome, Julia Leifert. Mira von der Osten is founder and designer of the independent Berlin label Kruber. The name is an abbreviation and stands for Create Resolutions Using Berlin Arguments. After completing her studies at Parsons School of Design in New York and Paris, Mira worked for different, different brands such as Issey Miyake, Tommy Hilfiger and Donna Karen. Mira Designs combines subtle interventions, intricate cuts, and an architectural approach. And when I asked her what digitalization means to her work, she told me that she and her team envision creating designs for virtual spheres, such, for example, online games, and also produce up-on-demand using 4D technology. What that means, we will hear from her later. Tina Lutz Morris was trained in fashion and pattern making at Paris Edmo Esmod School and after work, afterwards worked, worked for Issey Miyake and Calvin Klein. And after 24 years in New York and the founding of her first brand, Lutz and Patmos, Tina returned to Germany and launched Lutz Morris, a line of German made luxury handbags. She says, the challenge is to find the right balance between digitalization and artisanship. Last not least, Michael Pfeiffer from Mood. Mood also is an abbreviation and sta stands for Made Out of Trash. The upcycling label produces solar leaf from thrown away textiles and also supports different social venues in Berlin. Mood was founded by Michael and his best friend Niels, who does the design work. Michael is more into numbers. Uh, and they started in April 2020 during the first lockdown, so there was no alternative to digital first. And at the moment, they are evolving from pure digital to a combination of offline and online. As I said, Michael has a background in startups and fintechs and says, for mood, digital processes are a matter of course. So, Michael, what processes do you mean exactly? Can you give us some insights? Yeah, um, good question. So, um, first of all, uh, thank you all for, um, for having us. Um, as you just said, mood started in April 2020 with the first lockdown, so there was not really an alternative to starting online. And if we look at the whole value chain of, um, of Mood as a company, we try to be as digital as possible in every step. Um, this means that we are not 100% digital, mm -hmm. but for example, that we try to have our internal communication, our task management, everything online. So we 
don't work in our office with, with post-its and stuff like that. So everything here is fully digital. Um, we have different sales channels um, where we also focus mainly on online. We have our own uh, online shop. Um, we are listed in several um, platforms. Um, online marketing is our um, pure focus. We don't do mm -hmm. offline marketing, for example. And um, yeah, yet there are still other processes in the value chain which are not digitalized. Mm -hmm. um, for example, when it comes to, to design, there are a lot of things that we can still improve. Um, but if we think about digitalization, um, if, if you asked me the, the question a couple of years ago, what, what does digitalization mean mm -hmm. for, for a company? Probably I would have said it, it's all about increasing revenues and, uh, and cutting costs. And what would you say now? Um, if, you, if you see it's, it's 2021 and right now it's, it's not only about increasing revenues and cutting costs, but it's also a lot about sustainability. And maybe this is also something that we can dive deeper um, into, yes, the, we will, into the following course. minutes. But I also believe that digitalization is a great mean to improve sustainability overall mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. in the end we, we don't do it for the sake of doing digitalization but it's a mean and um, I think this mean digitalization can so be used for sustainability. What I was well. wondering since you are working with um, thrown away textiles how do you know uh, do you know in advance how many fabrics there will be available and is this also on an online channel or will you get a fax or something else and it says okay we have 200 kilos of this fabric do you want it or so in the end the uh, all the pieces that we produce are unique or um, so for example uh, the t-shirt that i'm wearing is an old bed sheet um, the trousers are old curtains the Jackets are old wool blankets. Wow, um, very, so very nice curtains. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So every, everything is a unique piece. Um, if, if you take one bed sheet, for example, just due to the size of the bed sheet, there's a maximum of two or three pieces that you can get out of that bed sheet. Um, so to answer the, your question, no, we don't know exactly, um, or we, we don't know at all um, how our next products will, will look like. In the end, the, um, the, the size or the... Uh, the shape is the same, but the patterns are always different. Okay. Julia, what about you? Digitalization and fashion, what does it mean to you? And, of course, for your brand. Um, to me, um, it means, yeah, the, the future of retail, the future of um, growing a brand. And, of course, it's like we heard, um, it's the core of everything um, mm. about sustainability. Um, when I started the brand, um, or sustainability is, is the core of my brand. Um, yeah, it's okay. in everything mm -hmm. what I do. And um, if you um, go, for example, for, um, to the design process or to um, making a prototype, to um, pattern making, um, in the past, everything was um, I would say um, offline, you had to draw, you had to um, make a sample, and um, then you find out, okay, this is not the right fitting, mm. or um, you want something different, then you um, have to change the pattern and to sew it again. And um, in the future, um, all of those processes can be done digital. And this is something where you can um, yeah, um, minimalize um, waste mm -hmm. and, of course, time and um, be more productive. I just wanted to say it sounds like a whole lot of work doing all those steps. So are you looking forward to the future where this will be all be, do, uh, be done online and digital? Or maybe will you look back and say, hmm, the old days weren't so bad at all? Oh, I, I think it's um, it's great um, okay. to be honest because um, you can work with um, avatars, you can um, play around with um, fabrics, with um, texture, with um, whatever you have in mind. And it's um, when you're in this um, design process, um, usually you have an idea, and it takes a long time to 
get it into um, the piece you have in mind. And probably then it's, it's too late to involve this, this um, idea of what you had in mind. And mm -hmm. so you can, you can do it um, right away, um, see it on the computer, and then um, you have, for example, um, two, three ideas that doesn't work, and then you just um, make the fourth, and then, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's great. Okay. So, Mira, I s just saw you nodding. So, what about you? Fashion and digitalization, please tell us. How does it work? I was, I was nodding to digitalization being great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, of course, we have viewers on a live stream. Uh, yeah, it's a good thing. I guess. So, okay, please. No, overall, I think digitization gives us uh, great opportunities, especially as independent brands. Mm -hmm. um, I think, number one, it, it gives us the chance to put our designs into a broad audience. Um, on top of it, I think, um, I feel we're currently at a point of experiencing almost an industrialization in fashion, because if you look at the past, it was always um, a factory in our um, industry, was just a room with uh, sewing machines and people being able to sew uh, and cut and iron. And, um, and I think um, right now we, we're developing machines that um, probably don't limit us as designers to two salvages, so we could um, we can, I mean, I think we're almost there of n not only knitting up garments, but weaving up garments, mm -hmm. um, so four-dimensional. Yeah, that's... What you were saying by 4D design, okay. Yeah, four-dimensionally, meaning just it versus the 3D printer, we can, because these um, finished garments will be moving, will be changing, so that's the fourth dimension. So I, I, I view it as, as a, a fantastic opportunity to really um, only produce what we need. So we don't need to overproduce. We don't have waste if we work like this. At the same time, I see a very high risk of this um, um, cutting out labor force out of um, the production and um, probably accelerating mass production mm -hmm. to a degree we can only imagine today. So I, I see a big... Like a two-bladed sword. Yeah, oh. a big in danger end, no of that will, happening. In the end, no one will be left who can buy the stuff. <laughs> 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 okay. okay. Um, Tina, I found this very interesting, so um, let me repeat it again. You, you told me that uh, when we spoke before, the, the challenge in your eyes is to find the right balance between digitalization and artisanship. And I guess this is what you were referring to, uh, too. So um, do you manage it to <laughs> handle everything? Or are you struggling because the digi digital aspects are, are so time consuming? Um, it's a constant struggle because I feel like I, um, I kind of had two different lives. So my first uh, line, Lutz and Patmos, was um, a big line, number-wise. What, what do you mean by big? Can well, you give us some numbers? Well, I would say, like, we <coughs> would, you know, production minimum would be 300 pieces per color, which we would meet very easily. Um, we were a big team. Um, we launched in New York in 2000, and um, the run of the line was 11 years. And so we didn't have any website, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but we were very, we, I'm saying me and my business partner, we yes, were very I advanced in digitalization because the main core of our collection was knitting. And so we, you know, were one of the first who started working in seamless knitting. Um, programming Shima machines, working with Shima, just really working on um, no wastage knit uh, processes. But we had no website because back then you didn't really have a website yeah, to sell on. So <laughs> okay. our main business Everything was started back then. Yeah, okay. to, to sell wholesale. Um, you know, like, uh, you know, to the Barneys and, you know, the big department stores in, in the U.S., but also, you know, in, you know, all over the world. And um, when I arrived in, in Berlin, 
in, in the meantime, I was also after, you know, the, the line, um, you know, my business partner, I separated. I was cons consulting for a lot of companies in New York, and one of them was, for example, trying to figure out 3D body scanning and seeing if you can make made-to-measure clothing, which didn't work at all, because it just you know, if you just even look around the room, how different everybody's body is shaped. Even if you scan a body and then, you know, we try to make these custom-made jeans, it doesn't work because sometimes you want to buy a pair of pants that is like a size bigger because you want it a little slouchier or maybe even two sizes bigger. Um, so that part of digitalization didn't quite work for me. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I arrived in Berlin, I really, I think it was almost like I wanted to do the opposite of what I did in New York. I did not want to work with big factories all over the world. I didn't want to make mass things. I really wanted to get back into that tactile work with oh, material and work with artisans. So now my digitalization is to, you know, sell 90% on our website and just do very little wholesale. Mm -hmm. So that part of digitalization is incredibly important. But what I cherish right now is that, you know, I work with my artisans. I know everyone who works in our bags personally, even all the people who supply um, the ingredients for the bags, because our bags are made in Germany with German materials, which is incredibly challenging. So everything from the leather to the chains from the Black Forest to the sewing yarn is, um, comes out of Germany. 5% mm -hmm. comes from Italy and Spain, but it's really slow fashion where everything is sourced in as close as possible to the factory. Um, but I feel just, this yeah, yeah, sorry. just let me ask one thing. Yeah. I was wondering, so you m uh, you're producing all those wonderful bags, and let's take a look in the future. And at some point, there are so many people who want your bags. And would you then say, okay, that's just how much we can produce, or would you scale up, even if that would mean doing some optimization, or would you then say, no, it's limited? This is the way it should be done. This is the way I want it to be. Or I would not scale up. Okay. Yeah, okay. I would. I would um, because the three pillars that the brand is built on is artisanship, responsible mm. production, and also giving back. So we have a charitable donation built into every bag sold to every mother counts. Um, yeah. And mm. would you say are there any um, since we were speaking so much about workshops and the uh, people doing the actual actual labor with their hands, crafting all those products, which of course takes time. Um, but would you say there are any other uh, aspects uh, that are limited by digitalization that can't be done by machines or? I think. Y you know, like artisanship has the word art in it, right? So it is an art to create. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the bags that we make, I mean, I, the, the, the reason why I even got into the accessory business was because I fell in love with um, a leather case that had a frame, a metal frame on it, and I fell in love with the construction, and I started doing research, and it was a German specialty to work with this frame. And um, so when I did research and I got, you know, I got so inspired by this leather case that I wanted to um, find the artisans who can work with the frames. And, um, and I couldn't find anyone in Italy or in France who could do it because first, my first idea was like, oh, we mu I must make it in Italy, until I realized, no, this is really a German specialty. And that, for example, is a, a process that no machine can make, like mm -hmm. getting that leather into the frame securely is, uh, you have to do it with your hands. Okay. Julia, um, before you were saying you were looking forward to the point where many of your simple work steps can be done digital, but now if you hear from uh, Tina, would you say, well, of course there are some aspects of my, of my work that I will always be doing by hand and by drawing, or would you say, no, actually, if I could do everything 
on the computer I will do it or? I won't. Okay, um, so what are your limits? I'm um, fascinated um, by uh, fabrics. And I guess um, when you have a piece of cloth in your hands, um, you need to feel it. You need to yeah, see the structure and everything um, to or for in, in the fabric to mm -hmm. know what mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. will mm -hmm. do with it. And of course, um, the customers will see and feel the difference. Um, so I guess or for me, it's, it's, it can't be digitalized um, to have fabrics around and work with them. And um, of course, you have, um, like in couture, you mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. um, special sewing techniques um, and, and so there's like an emotional part patterns, of um, that the work, you, yeah, yeah, you, yeah. you, you see and feel the difference. Um, so I guess um, this is something you can't digitalize. Uh, okay. But of course, on the other hand, we will um, in future, like uh, when, you, when you think about NFT or whatever, mm -hmm. we will probably have a digital wardrobe. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, we will always um, have something in our hands. Uh, that brings me to uh, Mira again, speaking about NFT non-fungible tokens. Is this something you would like to do with your brand? And when we spoke before, you told me that, well, uh, maybe the fashion industry could be a whole lot more sustainable if we just wouldn't produce actual product, but digital product. Um, yes, I think we're at a time where we... Um constantly remind ourselves that we don't need to throw out all these products into the market and I think all designers are reflecting upon you know um, how to produce less how to really focus on craftsmanship um, and not over you know overproduce all the time don't create waste and I think um, at the same time, you know, there's this aspect of how we all all run a business, and we and on and so it's a balance, like you were saying, to navigate between those two. And I think one aspect of um, digitization, which I think is not solved yet with the NFT, because the NFT is using too much energy. Mm -hmm. So as with the uh, Bitcoin, the right Bitcoin, now, yeah, yeah with the blockchain technology um, using too much energy I don't think I I don't think that's a real option but I'm thinking generally to be able to distribute my designs into the digital sphere or the virtual sphere um, for example to be able to dress a character in a game or anything else that's only in the digital or virtual sphere um, I find extremely um, exciting and I think um, it's a great chance. And um, e e exciting, why? Because it's such a big industry. I mean, it's nowadays even bigger than the film industry. More people are playing video games. Do you play video games actually or is this something? No, I don't okay. play video games. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> My kids do. Yeah. And, um, so, but, but, but why the excitement? Why the excitement? Because I think, um, I think it solves a lot of problems right now. For example, um, I think, um, number one, um, on many levels, you could get rid of a lot of logistics. I think if mm. you can easily try on garments virtually, you don't have to order them all and send them back. Um, so I think I understand that young customers probably want to you know, check out five evening gowns when they have an important occasion. So what they do right now, they order five evening gowns and send back four or all. Or, or maybe um, five. <laughs> yeah. Or, um, so I think if we could eliminate, I think that's one aspect to eliminate um, a lot of mass produced clothing into the virtual sphere. The excitement for me to be existing in the virtual sphere is because I can um, I can um, give my design, I can do storytelling, I can um, make them come alive and explain um, by a character that I dress in, let's say, 
I mean, I was just talking to someone from the gaming industry and he was telling me that he is working on a game that is trying to make black and white, Fr French black and white movies oh. um, interesting for the younger generation. And so, you know, it's not, we have so many games at this point that that I would play. <laughs> yeah. So. <We're> back. <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, as we learned and are still experiencing, uh, even fashion weeks can be held completely digital. Uh, um, Michael, Michael, what do you think? Um, do small independent labels have more to gain in a digital world than the major competitors, the major players? Or would you say, well, the disadvantage is on our side and we can't compare? Uh, y yes and no. So um, I think with the um, uh, with digitalization, there comes advantage that from one second to the other, you can at least theoretically, reach a huge customer base. So you can send your products to everyone in the world. You can advertise it to anyone out there. But also digitalization um, is, of course, for established companies a good opportunity to promote their brand um, much more to establish their, their brand. Um, but with this... Um, a shift into digital, I believe that big corporates have to struggle a lot more than young and especially small companies. So, um, so, we so wh why is that? Why do they have to struggle more? Uh, simply because of their, their size. So um, if you want to, um, for example, want to um, Get get your team digital. I mean, um, you also need the people, right? To um, to to be on board, you, you need people to use the digital tools. So it's not solved with um, having thousands of different tools. You also need people to to do that. Um, so starting with the team, um, you can convince five to ten people easier to use online tools than um, I don't know several thousand people. Um, then uh, there's also the possibility for small companies to, to test and learn quickly um, and maybe also to, to fail fast. Oh. So um, fast and break things. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, I mean, if, uh, if a small company fails fast, then okay, what happens? Worst case, um, a couple of people lose their job for some time, but it's completely different size if you think of big corporates um, with several thousand employees. So there are pros and cons, but in the end, I think um, for small companies, for young companies, it is actually um, a good opportunity to, to gain from this momentum uh, and to profit from digitalization. I was just wondering, would you tell us um, maybe what were some of the failures or mi mistakes you were experiencing with your brand? Was there something where you said, oh, we just really failed in this one and what did you learn from it? Um, yeah, oh, so, uh, of, of course, uh, happy, happy to share some, uh, <laughs> not all, but um, I think one, um, one good one is when we started with our first homepage, like we also, um, so, so, so I have a business background, my, my co-founder, he's a designer, but we both are not experts in online marketing, no, like neither him mm -hmm. nor me has built a homepage before. The whole so signs for itself. So um, we, we had our first homepage, everything was working well. Um, and uh, then last uh, year, the homepage was live for, I don't know, like three, four months or so. Um, there was a, a little TV show where we were mentioned. Um, it was... Um, which is good news, which I would is, say. Which, <laughs> which, is, which is good news, right? I mean, th th that's a good sign. Like, like, people are interested in what you're doing. And it was like, I don't know, four or five minutes uh, advertisement. Um, of course, a report about our brand. And um, we were... Um, sitting at home and we were checking uh, Google Analytics and seeing, okay, like the, the, the numbers increasing, more and more people are coming on our website. And then all of a sudden, numbers stopped and turned back to zero and we're like, okay, what, what went wrong? What, what, what went wrong? What, what, what's the problem? And then we 
ourselves entered our website and saw, okay, the homepage is down. So um, it yeah, was, it was too much traffic. Or yeah, it was it was too much traffic. So apparently, our website was not built for that much traffic within a matter of seconds. So like like, like when the the show started, of course, within the first three seconds, several hundred thousand people uh, came on the website, and our webshop was not that stable enough. <laughs> so yeah. That but I would say, you le mood, learn from this, and maybe to our viewers on the screens at home, check for the website if it's still <laughs> running, <laughs> up and running, or... <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, all of you are part of the Digital Fashion Future Readiness Program. Um, Julia, why did you apply? And what would you say are your brand's greatest, let's call them, weaknesses when it comes to digitalization? Um, I would not call it weakness, okay, but what it's are, what a kind challenge. Of opportunities are there? Opportunities. Okay. Um, um, it's a challenge, um, especially in, in women's wear, to um, have the perfect size and fitting. Um, so this is something you can't, um, if you sell online, people can't try the pieces. And so you have to, to really um, do a great measurement and to have well-fitted um, clothes. And so we do work um, with um, 3D um, body scan. And I am in this program to gain this process, to become better at um, sizing and fitting and to learn how to um, yeah, work with um, the needs of our customers and, and to um, get better in that. So um, how does it work nowadays? I can remember there used to be this brand from, I think they were from Japan, and they had, ah, it was called Zozo, which is a very big player in Japan, and they had this suit, black suit, very tight with uh, white spots on it, and you had to put it on and then uh, turn in front of your smartphone camera and you would be measured. And the result um, actually turned out quite good, I would say. So is this the same technique you want to use or is it working completely different? Or It's a little bit different. Okay. Um, so you um, have um, this QR code on our, our website and then you um, can scan yourself with your smartphone mm -hmm. at home. Mm -hmm. And we um, become all the data and then we have um, those information with um, which we can work on. So okay. Um, so it's not it's not um, the clothes are digital. Yeah, this yeah, is the know. next step. Yes, um, <laughs> what we are working on. Um, but yeah, right now you have um, you can scan yourself and then we get the data. So speaking about data, um, data means nothing if you can't read it or you don't analyze the data you are. Uh, getting. Uh, Mira, do you analyze your data? What kind of data is there around with your brand? Is it just from the website or do you buy industry reports or? So true about being able to read the analyze, um, the analysis of everything. Um, yes, we do look at our numbers. I always say, um, or being the creative part, I always say, let's look at the numbers and then let's forget them when it comes to designing. Mm -hmm. um, I think our world is generally, especially in fashion, ruled too much by data. Mm -hmm. It takes all yeah, the fun out of, out of designing if you only, I think generally that's um, something that's happening with digitization. If we only listen to it, um, we lose um, the secret, um, the glamour of our industry. I think our customer doesn't want delivered everything that he clicks. He wants to be, have a surprise every season. So I can't surprise that customer if I only listen to their data. So generally my take is listen and then when I design Forget about Get it. Get a piece of it. Okay. Well, and of course, bit. you know, understand, use it to understand who's interested in your brand, but don't um, make it rule how you necessarily design. 
Tina, you were speaking with so much passion about this frame, so I want to ask you too, would you say that a data-driven design approach is threatening your creativity or can it maybe both be combined and evolve into something even better or? I think it's, it's definitely important to listen to the data. Um, like, for example, we have one bag we can't keep in stock right now. It's constantly sold out. So it would not be smart to say, okay, we're not doing that bag mm -hmm. next season. You know, we would expand colors of the bag and then make an extension of the bag. Like, you know, this one happens to be quite rigid. We'll make it soft. We, you know, like you, you have to listen to the data. But what I wanted to come back to is, you know, because digitalization um, for my business, what I'm really excited about, you know, working with a fashion council is the digitalization that measures sustainability, um, that can measure your carbon footprint, that can improve your um, practices. And for example, the German tannery we're working with, they now um, offer the possibility to trace the heights where they're coming from. Okay. So that is a big thing, for example, in the industry, you know, the leather tanning industry, um, that, you know, like the heights that we're using come from Germany or from Holland, and they are a byproduct of the dairy or meat industry. Mm -hmm. So they're not coming from India, because for us, Car, you know, um, shipping distances are incredibly important. We're trying to do everything as close yeah. as possible. And labor conditions in India are cruel, at least. Yeah. yeah. Ah. So our tannery now offers that every hide is basically tacked. And we want to figure out how we can um, give that information to the customer mm -hmm. so that you have a, uh, a, a code into the, in the bag that you can scan and you can actually see exactly where the height is coming from, where it was made and who made the bag. Mm -hmm. Because I feel transparency, especially in the luxury market, is the true luxury. Mm -hmm. Because there are a lot of big luxury companies who actually don't really produce very mm -hmm. um, sustainable. <laughs> so and, and so for us, you know, in the market to, to stand out, it's really important to um, give the customer the transparency. And for that, you need digitalization. That reminds me of uh, your brand, Julia, and what is displayed on your website. You write also about the transparency and how you want to, how you want to give your customers insights and how the way things are produced and so is so this something you could imagine for your brand too, to make the whole process transparent from this is the people who've been working on it? And yes, um, we are working um, with a small company and this is going to be um, implemented into the website that you can see where's the fabric from, where is it um, produced, with um, which um, thread and if there are um, certifications and, and Mm -hmm. Everything mm -hmm. you need to know about. Yeah. Okay. I guess okay. it's it's super important to, um, yeah, be true. Since we've been speaking so much about listening and understanding what people want, uh, I'm looking at the audience, and I was interested in if there would be any questions. So, please, if someone has a question for the panel, now is the chance. Okay doesn't matter at all. Yeah, I see a question over here. Can we have a microphone maybe just a second? We need a microphone and then we can listen. Okay, so thank you very much, Stefan. Hello, thank you. My name's Godfrey Dini. I'm from Fashion Network in Paris. Um, people always talk about all the positive things in digitalization. What, there must be something you've lost, though. Are, are, is, are there no negative elements to it? Is it all good? I'd love to know what, what you think has maybe lessened your creativity or maybe made you that bit more distant from the, ultimately from the consumer by, by everything being online. So would you, someone special, have uh, answer your question or? Any, any. So very interesting I question. Who would like to start? 
I mean, what's, I, what's been I, lost? I think the negative thing about digitalization is, is that many times it's, it is so expensive and so work intensive to implement it that it feels like you go five steps backwards before you go forward. So it's quite challenging for a small company. I also feel that digitalization was really exciting when it really started. You know, how big was the difference between an iPhone 4 and an iPhone 5? <laughs> right yeah. now, between a 12, you know, 11 and uh, a 12, it's like, you know, it's kind of going. Going. <laughs> yeah. But I think digitalization is not going this way. I feel like it is, it's like a push and pull. And um, I feel also the younger t generation is a lot more critical towards digitalization because now we know the negative as aspects of it. You know that you know you can shut down power plants. You know that countries can you know like you know interfere with each other's you mean cyber hacking and cyber, cyber attacks hacking. And cyber war. And that's not only the thing, but you know, I consulted for a company and their website got cyber hacked and they had to pay five hundred thousand dollars to get the website back up and running. So you know, there is a lot of negativity mm -hmm. for digitalization. And I think, you know, what I said about, you know, the five steps back, I feel like for a lot of younger people, there's also that hesitance, like, do I really want to go five steps back? Because when does it really actually pay? You know, when do I really go forward with this investment of time and money? Mm -hmm. um, and I feel there is a whole trend back to, you know, really doing things more manually. But I think, you know, in the end, digitalization is probably, you know, this kind of a thing, because it has its positivities, but then I also feel like it also has its negativity. So, digitalization is a bumpy road. It is, I think. <laughs> what about you, Michael? Yeah, I, I agree that it, it's it's not a straight line. Um, so there are some some ups and smaller downs, um, but overall, I, I really see the the advantages that that come with it. So so one point you mentioned is that we we lose the the proximity to the customer, which is true when it comes to someone entering a store and buying something. But at the other time, you also learn so much when somebody buy something online. So um, you can get um, customers buying your products several times um, and probably you, you have never seen them, but from the data you know, oh, okay, this is a customer certain age um, and um, lives in this certain lo uh, location. So maybe um, just out of the data we know that we should open a pop-up store in that city because um, we learned so much online about our customers that we haven't even met before that it also brings us again back closer to the customer. So yeah, I think there are many advantages that, that come with it. True, also some, some disadvantages. Cyber hacking, of course, that's a big thing. Um, but yeah. So... I think um, that you don't ha you have to make sure that digitization doesn't take over. Um, and I think, like you say, I, I'm, I'm very hopeful looking at the younger generation who makes very clear decisions on um, what, where you see an advantage for you and where y it doesn't lead you or it's more work. Um, so I think generally I'm hoping that for mid-size or independent um, brands in our industry, we can access it as a benefit. Um, but of course, as I said before, I think um, big corporations might use digitization to continue really producing fast fashion. And that's, I think, in our industry, the absolute downside of digitization. So maybe it's just with every tool, it depends on how you use it, what are you trying to do with it, and uh, I see. So um, looking at, ah, oh okay, we have another question over there, so. Hey, Would you I please uh, stand up and? Yeah, uh, Patrick, <laughs> hi. Hi. I just wanted to touch on your point about fast fashion because I worked briefly on a digital collection and I 
somehow thought that possibly it could bring some solutions to the problem of fast fashion that we could offer digital clothing as a replacement of in, at some point in the future, but I'd love your thoughts on where like actual digital clothing would fit in, in your opinion, in the future. I was a little bit late, so sorry if you already covered it. <laughs> I, I'm not sure I got your question about digitization fitting in. Yeah, I mean, um, are you just, what, did, did you just uh, want to say that you love the idea of digital clothes, <coughs> sorry, clothes, or do you have an actual question? I'm sorry, it's a bit hard to understand. <coughs> digital clothing, like your opinion on actual digital clothing ah, okay. and digitization generally. Ah, so and <coughs> its ability to potentially take some of the fast fashion market away from physical product in the future as we move towards a world where people could wear things purely digitally instead of in the physical world. Okay, I see. So we spoke about that before, but maybe Mira, you just want to repeat it in two to three sentences because we are already... Over running time. out of time. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just mentioning that in fast fashion, and I think it is happening. I mean, I think people uh, these days uh, try on already um, digitally clothing. And um, for example, we have a lot of influencers who order a garment and um, send it across the world just to try it on for an hour to take a image and then put it on their Instagram account. So if, if all of that can be placed into the digital work world, um, I find that a really um, fantastic tool to, to stop um, and make f f this, this aspect of fast fashion more sustainable. Still, yeah. it would be very sad if your shirt would be online only. <laughs> So um, our time is over. I'm very sorry. Um, thanks for joining us. There were mm -hmm. Michael Pfeiffer, Tina lutz Morris, Mira van der Osten, and Julia Leifert. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.